Hello. Thank you for joining us for Unite for Sight's webinar about strategies for improving health outcomes. My name is Jennifer Staple Clark, and I'm founder and chief executive officer of Unite for Sight. I'll start by briefly introducing you to Unite for Sight. I'll review the webinar logistics, and then we'll hear from our five expert panelists. Unite for Sight is a global health nonprofit organization that promotes high quality care for all. We have healthcare delivery programs that provide care for patients living in extreme poverty in Ghana, Honduras, and India. And we also have a number of different global health education events, including Social Entrepreneurship Institute, as well as the Global Health and Innovation Conference. The Social Entrepreneurship Institute occur is occurring on December 5th of this year. And the information about that event is at uniteforsight.org slash institute. And we also have a Global Health and Innovation Conference coming up on March 28th and 29th. And both of these are, are at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. I'll describe the basic logistics of this webinar. And we're so delighted to have all of you with us today. We have five amazing panelists. And they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Each panelist will give a two-minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their greatest lessons learned related to improving health outcomes. And then we'll dedicate the remaining time to your questions and answers. And we received many stellar questions already submitted from you, our audience members, by Sunday's question submission deadline. And we selected the most common and most thoughtful questions to ask our panelists. And we also invite you to submit additional questions in the text box on the left of your webinar screen today. And we'll select those questions to ask the panelists today as well. It's important that we define outcomes for you and how we will discuss outcomes today. It's essential to differentiate between outputs and outcomes. And the easiest way to demonstrate this is through several examples. So consider a program that distributes malaria nets in order to reduce rates of malaria. The organization might report their output, which would be the number of nets that they have distributed. And the assumption is that everyone receiving a mosquito net surely must be using it, and therefore the rate of malaria will decrease. However, simply distributing something, whether it's malaria nets, medication, or any other item, does not mean that it will be used correctly or used at all. For example, malaria nets are frequently used for purposes other than for malaria prevention, as many people think that it's actually a fishing net can be used as a soccer goal and for other purposes. So an organization might say that they've distributed 10,000 malaria nets, but if they haven't measured the reduction in malaria, they actually have no idea if all of their effort and resources are actually making any impact on malaria. Similarly, if a program focuses on medical care, it's important to assess how much more the number of patients, much more than the number of patients seen or provided with care. So what are the outcomes of the patients who are receiving the visits, for example? Are surgical patients receiving follow-up care to ensure that they are not having further morbidity or mortality? And for example, in this slide on the webinar visuals, we see a photo of a patient who had a cataract surgery. An organization might include this patient in their outputs as they describe the number of people who received surgery. However, in this next slide on the screen, we see the patient's actual outcome. And this patient had received a cataract surgery from a short-term program that had come into his country, provided the surgery, and left without any linkage with the local doctors and without any follow-up care. And to be clear, this patient was not at all related to any of Unite for Sites program. After his surgery, the patient ultimately developed an infection, but didn't know how to access local eye care. And he therefore, unfortunately, completely lost sight in that eye and he had irreversible blindness because of that. Meanwhile, the organization that provided this man with eye care would be counting him as one of their outputs, one of the patients who had received care. But clearly, he had a terrible outcome. So this demonstrates the importance of differentiating between outputs and outcomes. It's such an essential difference. And a final prime example is Play Pumps, which is an organization that had received widespread attention around 2005 and $60 million were invested in the first Clinton Global Initiative into this program through a public-private partnership which was established between the US government and the Case Foundation. And it was expected that children would plan the play pumps as seen in this slide. 
and that the children by playing would draw water out of the ground into a storage tank and that it would provide clean water for thousands of communities. And the focus was on output, how many play pumps could be installed rather than on outcomes of those communities receiving these play pumps. And in the end, play pumps were often in disrepair with no one available to fix or maintain the pumps. Children had little to no interest in playing on that merry-go-round and it actually ended up being a lot of adult women, especially many elderly women, who had to move the big merry-go-round around and around in order to get water for their family and community. And there was a long string of other issues associated with play pumps as well, and ultimately in 2010, the organization ended and became defunct. Instead of making the water more accessible, play pumps actually removed accessibility to water for many communities and many thousands of people. So we see from these three examples that it's always essential to measure the impact of health programs by assessing outcomes and not just outputs. And Unite for Sight is very committed to helping professionals and students understand the importance of measuring outcomes, not just outputs. And we have many educational programs and materials that are focused exactly on this topic. We're thrilled to have an absolutely phenomenal group of panelists today who will share with you their expertise and tremendous insights about strategies to improve health outcomes as well as how best to measure outcomes. So we'll proceed now with having each of our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. And I'm delighted to introduce to you our first panelist, Lisa Hirshhorn. Lisa, please begin by introducing yourself, your background and current role, and please share your greatest lesson learned related to improving health outcomes. Sure. Um, so thank you for uh, inviting me on this panel, and, and good afternoon to, to everybody. Um, so my name is Lisa Hirshhorn. I am uh, currently the uh, Director for Implementation Improvement Sciences at Ariadne Labs, which is an innovative uh, partnership between Harvard School of Public Health and Brigham Women's Hospital founded by Atul Gawande, um, and also working as a Senior Advisor for Partners in Health and uh, based at Harvard Medical School. Um, I began my sort of interest in measurement and improvement um, back when I started doing HIV work in the 1980s and um, ran an HIV clinic in a uh, community health center in Boston in our, our own local resource limited setting and was really um, struck by the fact that, you know, we started to have, first we had no effective drugs and then we started to have effective drugs but that there were huge disparities and so I became very uh, interested in trying to measure uh, quality, so not just the output, but how good it is that you're actually uh, providing the coverage, and then are you actually uh, saving people? And I think, for me, one of the first lessons of, of why you need to look at outcomes was we became very effective in treating people with HIV with treatment, but everybody was still dying because of hepatitis C, and it's really only recently that we now actually have a cure from that. Um, I moved into global health uh, around 2000 because of the antiretroviral therapy uh, scale-up activities and uh, worked in that for, for a number of years and then was, have been at Partners in Health for about six or seven years uh, working on monitor evaluation and quality and about a year ago I've moved um, over mostly to Ariadne Labs uh, to expand the focus on primary care, maternal health and figuring out how do we uh, develop simple scalable solutions that are focused on the most critical moments in people's lives like birth and surgery and, and end of life. Um, in terms of, uh, I think, one of the most exciting uh, changes that I've seen in terms of improving outcomes has been some of the work that I've been privileged to work with with um, my colleagues in Rwanda at Nchuti Mubuzima, which is the Partners in Health Sister organization there. And uh, we sort of recognized that a lot of people were being trained in, in uh, care, particularly pediatrics care but uh, sometimes it wasn't the people who were providing care, and we also saw a clear drop-off on people's knowledge. And uh, working with that team and led by a very visionary nurse named Manzi Anatole developed a program called MESH, which is monitor, um, Mentoring and, uh, and Enhanced Supervision in Health Centers. And through that, we've seen really remarkable improvements in, uh, in the quality of care that we're delivering and also beginning to see uh, real improvements in terms of some of the outcomes that we're able to measure. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about the, the importance, but also some of the challenges about measuring outcomes uh, when we get into the question and answer sessions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Lisa. And Shuba, if you can please introduce yourself as well. Yes, 
Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for everyone attending today. Uh, my name is Shubha Kumar, and I'm an assistant professor in global health at the University of Southern California, USC, and also the director of our online Master of Public Health program. Our online MPH is actually a new program that allows students, typically working professionals, to earn their degree entirely online in conjunction with the hands-on field experience at a public health agency. We launched last year and we offer several specializations, including one in global health leadership, in case any of you are interested. In terms of my background, my training is in public health, excuse me, healthcare policy and management. I did my master's and PhD at UCLA and worked for several years in the nonprofit and NGO sector before coming to USC. About eight years ago, I led the startup of a humanitarian NGO um, providing disaster relief and health and education services across the globe. And I'd say that one of the key lessons I've learned while working in global health is the importance of planning, monitoring, and evaluation in order to improve health outcomes. We need strategies to be able to effectively plan and measure our outcomes and impact in order to know how well we're doing and where we can improve. In the for-profit world, it's often much easier to know how you're doing, but in global health and social sectors, it's not as easy for us to measure what counts and know what the return on your investment is. Just as Jennifer was introducing, you know, the subject of outputs versus outcomes and really measuring what counts and also involving um, beneficiaries in that assessment is seems to be a critical lesson and, and uh, element for moving forward. Um, and that kind of area has, has led me to my specialty in social return on investment analysis. SROI is a framework which involves key stakeholders, including beneficiaries, to help measure the social economic and environmental value being generated by a program or organization. So it's really looking at the triple bottom line and provides an estimate that for every dollar one invests in a program, the value it'll create or the social return on investment. And I'm happy to share more about it as we go through the webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shuba. And Chad, if you can introduce yourself as well. Great. My name is uh, Chad Rathner. And I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer for an organization called Mothers to Mothers based here in Cape Town in South Africa. And I first kind of got involved in, in, in these issues actually in the, in the early 90s or mid-90s as a um, Peace Corps volunteer in Mali. I was in northern Mali about 150 kilometers from Timbuktu. And, uh, you know, and, and it was on a real sort of you know, smaller level where you know, we would have NGOs come up into this area and they came with these really nice glossy materials and, you know, wonderful things and they would hand them out and, you know, they had these big stacks of materials and, and, and they would hand them out and then, you know, I would see them later on because I was living in that area and I would see everyone saying, wow, these are, these materials are so wonderful for wrapping our fish. Um, and, and for, for other things, but, but there were no, there was no messaging around it. Nobody understood what the materials meant. And I know that's an example that isn't necessarily related to health and health outcomes, but I think it speaks to the larger thing of that oftentimes you think, you know, you're having an impact with these things when in reality you're not. Um, so that's really how I sort of, you know, began to get, get involved in, in these issues. Uh, since then I've worked for, uh, primarily in the HIV and AIDS sector, uh, in the United States, and also most recently for the last eight years, uh, living and working as a chief of party on uh, uh, HIV and AIDS prevention program and HIV and AIDS organization development program. And most recently, I'm working uh, with Mothers to Mothers. Mothers to Mothers is uh, we train, employ, and empower mothers that are living with HIV and AIDS, uh, and they work as mentor mothers in health centers and communities. And in those health centers and communities, they provide essential health and education and psychosocial support uh, to prevent HIV transmission from mother to child, uh, prevention of mother to child. And since our founding in 2001, we've reached about 1.2 million HIV positive mothers uh, in nine countries with essential health and education and, and support through this mentor mother program. Uh, I think, you know, so in terms of the greatest you know, outcome or following, I mean, I think it's, it's really, um, you know, I think a lot, I mean, if you look at, like, the, the mother-baby packs, I mean, this was an initiative, uh, you know, back in the mid-2000, but, you know, where every mother was getting a pack of medication, uh, ART meds and, and other meds, and, you know, a lot of the focus was on handing these packets out. Um, and what was measured was the number of packets that were handed out. But, you know, in terms of actually having a health outcome or a health uh, impact, 
I think in many ways the impact was very low. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Chad. And Laura, if you can introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is um, Dr. Laura Statchel. Thanks so much for having me as part of this great panel. Um, I am an obstetrician gynecologist. I worked for 14 years in, pub in uh, private health care, and then I turned my attention to public health when I um, got my Master's of Public Health at UC Berkeley. And while I was a graduate student there, was invited to participate in a program um, studying maternal mortality in northern Nigeria. From that experience, it led me to start a nonprofit that focuses on bringing solar lighting and uh, solar energy to maternal health facilities, uh, primarily in Africa but also in Asia. Um, I would say that the greatest lesson um, that I learned in terms of strategies for improving health outcomes is that it's not enough to emphasize um, the education and the skill level for health workers, that health workers really need to be supported. And it really hadn't occurred to me until the work I started doing in Nigeria how many very bright health workers struggle because they don't have basic equipment and infrastructure to do their jobs. So I think it's incredibly important that health providers are backed with infrastructure. Um, that may be equipment, medications, uh, clean rooms to work in, and the focus of our organization is obviously lighting, electricity, and phone connectivity. Um, in addition, they need running water. Um, I think that so many health workers really fight tremendously to try and provide care while having to face these awful barriers because they are not being provided with basic amenities that are just so essential and that until I started working outside of the United States, I really hadn't understood how much of a role these things played in, um, in health outcomes. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And our last panelist, Jenna, if you can introduce yourself as well. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jana, <clears throat> my name is Jana Zindel, and I'm the Chief Program Officer for Ubuntu Education Fund. And uh, before I came to South Africa, I, I obtained my master's degree in international development and public policy from Georgetown, and then I headed down uh, to South Africa. And I've been working in Zwede Township in Port Elizabeth for, in South Africa for the last 12 years. Uh, I led the development of what we refer to as the Ubuntu model, and this model uh, is a comprehensive approach to working with a child and a family, and it involves health and psychosocial, academic, and household stability services. A lot of the other panelists have already mentioned some of the examples of uh, malaria nets and people wrapping their fish with materials. We've we experienced a lot of that in in our setting too, and we really we realized that we needed to really focus on a holistic model that started with the cradle and, and went all the way to career. So we really followed the children and their families that we're working with for the, we're in, we're in it for the long haul. So we just celebrated our 15 year anniversary at Ubuntu and, and we've really learned that the greatest strategies for improving health outcomes are really rooted in that combination of local and, and qual qualified staff and having the resources that, that was already mentioned and having that comprehensive care model. And the theory is really also that if we invest the same way in children around the world that we invest in our own children, we can level the playing field and it will lead to positive health outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jenna, and thank you to all of our panelists. Now we'll proceed for the rest of the webinar with the questions and answers. And we received, as I mentioned, many questions in advance from all of you, our audience members. And if you have additional questions during this webinar, please post them in the text box on the left of your webinar screen. And we have a lot of questions, so the sooner you are able to post them, the more likely we will be able to include it in our queue. So please feel free to include those questions throughout the webinar. For our first question for Lisa, what is the best way to identify evidence-based needs and evidence-based solutions? So um, I think one of the, the key challenges, and it's been exciting to see the recognition of it, although I don't think we necessarily have the solution, 
is how to do sort of evidence-based or data-driven um, decision-making, and whether that's in identifying where you're going to put your quality improvement or, and your resources or where you're, what solution you're actually going to use. So I think the, the lessons that I've learned is, first of all, use as much existing information as you can get. You know, have people already uh, have reports that show you that the main problem is that women come in for their first antenatal care but don't deliver, or that people with, uh, who test positive for HIV show up for the first visit but don't ever come back? So what's the existing quantitative information that you have and decide whether or not you actually need to collect anything new? Because a lot of times I find people say, oh, we have to measure new things. The second, and I say this as somebody who is very, very strongly quantitative, and I, when I went to my, get my MPH, I was taught uh, that a multitude of anecdotes does not, quanti does not constitute data, and I actually now disagree with that. So the second thing that I think is important is to ask questions. Um, identify what is it that patients are saying or frontline providers who sometimes really understand what are some of the needs. Once you um, have that sort of mixed methods approach for the needs, then you have to figure out what is the solution that best actually will address the gap. And typically, I think applying some of the basic knowledge we have from quality improvement in terms of understanding what should be happening, what are the potential root causes, and then figuring out, has somebody already come up with a good answer for this? So, you know, finding is there, are there other facilities or organizations that have already addressed this, uh, something we call positive deviance. Um, is there something in the literature? Is there something that uh, other people would know? And can, where do you have to locally adapt it and then implement it? And I think that that's an important thing, so that there's local ownership, um, but yet you're trying to accelerate change um, by actually spreading existing knowledge as opposed to always feeling like we have to create um, new solutions. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And Laura, how did you use research and data to identify the need for your organization and product? So when I first went to Nigeria in 2008, um, I went there because I knew that it was a place where it had one of the highest rates of maternal mortality. And there was research that was done by a group of Nigerians before I arrived um, using the system. Um, verbal autopsies to speak to family members of women who had died to try and understand everything that happened from the moment a complication occurred during labor to when a woman died. And one of the things that they um, found during these interviews was that women had gone to as many as four or five health facilities trying to get help and were being turned away repeatedly and then might arrive at a health facility and wait for care. And we call that um, the second delay and the third delay of getting care. And I was invited to actually spend time in a hospital and just come without any preconceived notion and just watch what was happening. So I was planted in a hospital serving a city of 1.5 million people. They were doing about 150 deliveries a month. Again, not with any preconceived notion of what might be the factors that were really impairing the delivery of life-saving care. And one of the things that really struck me when I was sitting observing about 14 hours a day was that they didn't have electricity 12 hours of each day. This was a hospital attached to the grid with a diesel fuel generator, but there was a very unreliable grid and there was um, not enough money for fuel. And without electricity, the hospital could not provide fresh uh, rapid blood for blood transfusions because there was not, no blood bank refrigerator. They didn't have lighting at night when uh, deliveries were occurring. They didn't have lighting at night for C-sections. They couldn't use machinery that was in the operating room when surgeries were being done. And I realized that even though the staff had a number of skills and were very dedicated, they were losing lives because of this infrastructure problem. I think without having done research, without having done what was called participant observation, this was something that wouldn't have occurred to me. It wasn't something that the staff came to initially um, identify as a major problem because they were so used to it. That was just the way every institution was in northern Nigeria at that time. Um, but clearly, uh, once light was provided, and we provided initially a solar electric system targeting four areas of the hospital critical for maternal survival, um, once that was provided, there was a, a great drop in maternal deaths at the hospital, and the hospital was no longer turning away people at night who were seeking care. Uh, again, research was the only way that we would have ever identified these as issues. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for your insight, Laura. And Chad, what are effective strategies to utilize local community members to significantly improve health, cal- health outcomes in a sustainable way? Yeah, I, mean, I think Lisa, you know, sort of mentioned it and hit it when she talked about local ownership. And I think what we've found through, you know, employing and, and working with mentor mothers and with mothers to mothers is that you're know, working with and through communities um, takes time, and it's a it's a sustained effort. Um, you have to develop unique relationships, and it's not just a you know fly in and, and fly out type of type of thing. Um, you know, and, and and the more carefully that you select. Uh, and in our case, that we select the the mothers that are part of our program, um, the more time that we spend appropriately training them, supporting them, um, having them know that they, I mean, they are our program, they are integral, the better outcomes there's ultimately going to be and the better care and service they're going to be able to provide to those mothers that are showing up at antenatal clinics. Um, you know, I think the other important piece is that, you um, the, the the strategies are owned and they're reinforced um, by the mentor mothers, but but in general, regardless of whether it's our program or any other program, also reinforced by the the communities themselves. You know, I think one of the other really, and I know this is you know controversial and debatable, is is looking at you know how uh, community members or volunteers are remunerated or not remunerated, not remunerated. Um, and there's certainly, you know, been for a while a growing body of evidence that there is, you know, that, that um, it's important to have some sort of remuneration in these types of programs. And, and you know, we certainly remunerate um, our volunteers through the Mentor Mother programs and see great, you know, great rewards from it. Great. Thank you, Chad. And Laura, how have you developed strategic partnerships to distribute the solar suitcases and to ensure their effective use? So we realized early on that we were only going to be effective if we worked with local partners who did have a lasting presence in communities. And so what we do is identify groups that have an ongoing um, relationship with health centers to try and strengthen healthcare in general. We work with sometimes small NGOs, uh, sometimes larger NGOs like Save the Children, CARE, and we also work with larger UN, UN agencies like World Health Organization, UNICEF, and UNFPA. Um, and then what we do, and then all of these agencies also bring um, the Ministry of Health into play because we tend to um, almost exclusively focus on government health facilities that we're trying to help. Um, and then what we do is we create training programs to build local capacity. And the training programs are designed to create trainers within these organizations, people that learn to do installations, learn to do maintenance of the solar electric systems, which we call solar suitcases, and learn to train health workers in how to optimally use them. Um, So we have both classroom trainings and then field trainings where people are actually doing the installation and training health workers. Um, And we also try and encourage communities to be very much involved on the day that the solar installation happens so that there is a sense of ownership. There's usually celebrations and singing, and we let the community members be involved in the installations and try and pass over that local ownership so that people are really aware that the health facilities now have continuous lighting at night and have electricity. Um, And we found that has been an effective way to minimize theft and to encourage more people to use the facilities as well. Um, And we are a very small NGO based in California, and there's no way that we could do these programs without having very strong partners in the field. Great. Thank you, Laura. And Shuba, can you describe the principles of social return on investment and explain how it can be applied to programs and organizations, and especially how it can be applied to organizations that may not have a lot of funding? Sure. Um, SRI is based on seven underlying principles in terms of how it should be applied. So the first one is to involve stakeholders, um, and that suggests essentially that stakeholders are best placed to describe how an intervention affects them, including beneficiaries, donors, staff, local government, et cetera, and therefore requires their consultation throughout the analysis process. The second principle is to understand what changes. So this means articulating a theory of change or impact map, um, which should be evidence-based, 
incorporating the stakeholders, positive and negative outcomes, as well as intended and unintended consequences. So really mapping the inputs to the outputs, outcomes, and ultimately the impact. The third principle of SRI suggests using financial proxies to measure the social value that's created. So assigning a dollar value to a social outcome. This is a somewhat controversial and a, you know, a challenging thing to do, uh, but it's the fundamental principle of SRI is, is that what gets measured gets valued. So it's a key process, uh, step in this process. Fourth principle um, is borrowed from the accounting world, which suggests including information which is material, i.e., which has the potential to affect stakeholders' decisions in the measurement and reporting process. The fifth principle, do not overclaim, suggests that an intervention should only claim the value it's creating and therefore requires taking into account trends, benchmarks, and the work of other organizations in the area. The sixth principle, be transparent, is about, um, essentially states that each step of the analysis and decisions taken throughout it should be documented. So when you're deciding which stakeholders to involve or which outcomes to measure, to document that step so persons reading the report can follow your logic. The seventh principle, verify results, is also borrowed from accounting and essentially suggests that independent assurance should be undertaken to verify results. In terms of your, the second part of your question, organizations who can try to apply SRI who might not have too much funding, um, it really depends on where the organization is at. Generally, organizations are already collecting some level of data in terms of their um, outputs and you know, working with stakeholders to identify needs and do evaluation. And so um, SRI can really build on processes that are typically already occurring. It's just taking it one level further in terms of doing the analysis and having good systems in place that enable you to collect that kind of data and analyze it. Great. Thank you, Shuba. And as a follow-up, can you provide a specific example of how social return on investment has been used to increase donor or grant support for a program, a specific program or organization? Sure. Um, so SRI can be applied at the planning or evaluation stage. So you can use it to project what the value is going to be or to actually me measure value that's already happened. And so um, in terms of working with donors, that you can use it, again, for a projection when you want to propose a new project and uh, give them information about what the projected impacts are and how stakeholders, particularly beneficiaries, um, are buying into this or not, what they think is critical of the project or on the evaluation side, you know, providing the information that says these are the outcomes that have happened, um, and particularly including lessons learned, um, can really be useful to donors in terms of seeing, you know, following the trajectory of what's happened and how it can be improved, and having that dollar value, that ratio of the investment to the return, uh, provides critical information to donors when making decisions, and also to management of, you know, the NGOs or other organizations were actually implementing the program. So for specific examples, I'd encourage um, listeners to Google uh, the International HIV AIDS Alliance. They've put out some great reports about programs that they've done and measured using SROI. Um, there's several small NGOs who are also experimenting with the method. Although it's not extremely widespread yet, um, it's picking up momentum given the kind of benefits it has that other planning and evaluation methods don't, uh, but you can certainly find specific examples and long detailed reports um, for anyone who's interested if you just Google on the internet. Terrific. Thank you so much, Shuba. And Jana, how has your organization measured social return on investment and how has it been important for generating public support? Uh, so what we do is we, we measure the status of all of the clients that we work with. We've actually created a system in partnership with McKinsey and Company, and it's rooted in a formula that we use that determines if a client is on or off track. And when I'm talking about this idea of on or off track, I, I'm essentially we're, we're looking at someone's health status. So I'm referring to their health physically, emotionally, and socially. And then we're also looking at household stability and educational in, indicators that we've we've created. So this on-off track system allows us to assess a client's well-being and then work with them to improve their status, and it allows Ubuntu to better tailor 
our intervention interventions to meet children's needs as they shift. And uh, McKinsey and Company then conducted an external evaluation and utilize, they utilized this tool and they found that after four years at Ubuntu, more than 80% of our clients achieved an on-track status. And this was actually a big eye-opener for, for us because we didn't even realize our own impact, so this was helpful. And it's great and so valuable when we're speaking about our work externally. And we've found that by keeping people on track, they end up not being a drain on society's resources, and instead they're able to contribute to society by being healthy, successful, employed adults. So an investment in an Ubuntu, in a, in an Ubuntu child yields a return for society. And then additionally, to analyze our long-term impact, we compare the outcomes of Ubuntu's graduate our clients that have gone through our programs with those of their peers in the townships where we work. So we specifically look at HIV drug regimen adherence rates and TB treatment success rates and matric pass rates, which is the high school exam in South Africa. And in 2014, for, in, for instance, Ubuntu had a 97% HIV drug adherence regimen compared to uh, Port Elizabeth's 57% and a 94% TB treatment success rate compared to the Eastern Cape's 41%. So while we feel like we have so many rich indicators of success that we see on the ground every day, such as observations and client feedback and, and staff analysis, these very quantifiable successes seem to resonate the most when we're talking to external parties and they help with generating that public support that we need. Terrific, thank you. And Lisa, how should evaluation research and data be integrated into organizations from the onset? So I, I think this is um, sort of very exciting that organizations are starting to think about this because I think um, in the past uh, it goes a little bit to what, what uh, the, talking about the social return on investment. What are the things that actually resonate with, uh, with donors, but also what are important things to know that you're actually doing the right thing? So I think. For me, the answer is that, that you have to have a learning organization. If you have, don't have an organization that's willing to be self-reflective, that's willing to um, understand where it could be better, it, you can put all the resources you want in there. It's not going to actually help. So there has to be engagement from leadership. There has to be planning. And there has to be some resources. Um, I, when I first started doing a lot of M&E, people said, oh, any dollar that goes to evaluation or to data is a dollar taken away from patient's care. And I think we've realized over time that if you really want to ensure effective quality services, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's social support, that you actually do need to do that. So you need to, you need to plan, you need to get leadership, you need to get funding. And then I think you need to be very clear about why you're measuring things and what you're going to be doing with that. And typically a lot of organizations I think are, are, should invest well in um, very strategic a collection of data, anything that somebody says to me it would be interesting to know or it would be nice to know, I sort of say, we're not going to measure that. Um, making sure that when you talk about evaluation, you're talking about, um, you know, what is the impact that you're having and what can you actually measure. So don't tell somebody you're going to measure change in maternal mortality if you actually can't do it. And really think carefully um, whether what you want to do is, is pretty rigorous evaluation or you actually want to do research. And I think that certainly some organizations will choose to do that, but also thinking about potentially partnering with people that that's sort of what they, what they do for, uh, for a living. But I think it is really critical that people are, are doing this, are not just collecting the data, but are actually looking at it, are using it to disseminate, to teach other people, um, and very importantly, to, uh, to improve from within. Terrific, thank you so much, Lisa. And Jenna, how does your organization apply monitoring and evaluation to its work in order to ensure responsible and effective programs? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, monitoring evaluation is essential to everything we do at Ubuntu, and it's integrated into all of all of our work. As I mentioned, um, we measure our success by by how deeply we reach each person. So we built our data system around this metric, and we created an internal system that allows us to thoroughly look at the depth of our programming. So, for example, when a child enrolls in our programs, they're assigned a family support specialist, which is essentially a counselor, a social worker. And that person's responsible for creating uh, the case management plan and then using that information from the comprehensive baseline assessments that we, we conduct as well as the on-off-track system that I explained earlier. 
And then that case management plan is essentially a timeline of the household stability, the health, and the educational interventions. And it's designed to address each of the individuals presenting issues or, or problems. And then that counselor oversees the implementation of the plan, works with Ubuntu's educators, our counselors, our social workers, and our clinical team. And then they will periodically compare the child's progress against her original case management plan and readjust it when, that's, when necessary. So throughout the year, data captures track each intervention in our client database from attendance in our after-school program to a flu shot to a home assessment, whatever it may be, and that serves as a centralized point of reference. Uh, and they can check anything that they need to check. Uh, so, of course, this is all linked back to the on-off-track system, and we're allowed to ensure responsible programming through that. I think uh, what Lisa had mentioned is so important. It's got to be strategic data, and we've had to say no to a lot of people who want us to measure things that just aren't important for our clients or for our organization to measure. Excellent. Thank you, Jenna. And Chad, how have outcome measurements been integral to mothers to mothers' ability to effectively scale up? Yeah, so outcomes are they're critically important for us. I, I think it was mentioned before about you know in the HIV and AIDS context, you know if a, if a woman if a mother comes to you know she she comes back uh, after her first antenatal visit, she's been tested and then she never for HIV and then she never comes back. Um, that's a tragedy for us. And you know, on a, on on a on a few levels. I mean, one for the health of the mother, but also for the health of of children. So, you know, we've really had to look at um, how do we build in uh, to our program, you know, a focus on outcome measurements um, and a focus on outcomes. And uh, you know, PMTCT is a prevention of mother to child transmission is a major focus of our program. But we can't only just talk about. Or what we found is that we can't only just talk about HIV. Um, if we can't keep a woman uh, to two, you know, two visits, uh, we're not going to have good retention. We see that after a woman's visited at least twice um, with a mentor mother, has become a program, then we have very good uh, retention data after that. But if we fail on those first two visits or after two visits, we don't have good retention. Um, it's also important, you know, we focus very much on um, once a child has been born, that child needs to be tested at six weeks and then again at 18 months. So, you know, out, programs, outcomes, and thinking about retention and adherence um, is, is critical. Um, and it's not just about the long-term, you know, thriving of, of children. It's not just about survival. It's also about, you know, their thriving. So, you know, one of the ways we've seen in doing that is really, like I said, not talking only about HIV. We lose interest when we do that. Um, but when we talk about you know, TB and malaria and cervical cancer, um, even, you know, bed nets, those are ways and in, in other, you know, other areas to be able to keep women interested, keep them coming back into the program, um, and then be, you know, give us an opportunity to be able to reinforce the messaging post-delivery, um, continue to uh, you know, provide them with skills, uh, and then also be able to, you know, it's critical for us to have an active client follow-up system, uh, which we do around sort of some SMS basing and phone-based programs. Thank you, Chad. And Laura, how can you achieve quality programming and outcomes measurements on a tight budget? I think it's really challenging to do it on a tight budget. Um, and I think that it's really important. Um, first of all, I agree with really what everyone has been saying so far. You need to think about this from the beginning. And I've learned that you need to be really humble in what you can expect to measure and also what kinds of claims you can make to your own intervention. In our case, we have a specific product. It's a solar suitcase. It's something that um, provides lighting at night. And in health clinics that don't have any lighting, it's pretty obvious that lighting should be something that will improve care. But how to measure that has been very challenging. We did um, one MacArthur-funded study where we actually looked at five different methodologies of how to measure um, what the impacts were and what the outcomes would be, and probably the best method we found was doing observations, just sitting and watching what happens, but that's very, very expensive, and it's very hard to get um, funders to want to fund that type of evaluation. We also did phone-based surveys where people were entering the kinds of uh, care they could or couldn't provide when they had lighting. We did questionnaires and interviews, and then we also did um, 
research where we looked at how the actual suitcase was performing, both by having remote monitors and also having questionnaires talking about how the suitcase was performing over time. Um, I think what I have learned over time on this is, number one, you need to include this in your budget and you need to actually have an M&E plan from the beginning. We try and work with partners that are already collecting the kinds of outcome data that we're interested in. So I had mentioned before the importance of partnerships. If we're working with a group like Save the Children that already is looking at uh, the number of neonatal resuscitations happening or the number of complications during pregnancy and the number of referrals, those are data that we can use um, when we're looking at how care changes when you add reliable electricity. Um, in the very first example of a hospital I worked in, there were so many maternal deaths that when we put in solar, we actually saw a drop in deaths. We now put solar suitcases in many health facilities that are rural sort of first-line centers that aren't really the ones equipped to provide life-saving care. They're more the ones to identify problems and then refer someone to another center. And so if you start off with a baseline where most of these centers have zero deaths a year or maybe one a year, you're not going to be able to show a change in maternal mortality. On the other hand, we know that providing skilled care to mothers is one way to reduce maternal deaths. And so getting women to not deliver at home where so many deaths occur and come to a clinic is, is a proxy that we use to try and get more information um, that will help us support the case that providing lighting as an incentive to get women into clinics is one way to sort of improve the whole ecosystem. We're doing a three-year study right now with AMREF in Uganda with four districts that are getting 145 solar suitcases throughout. And when you can start to get community-level data, I think that's when you can tell a bigger story. But these are very expensive studies to do. They're not things that you can really do on a tight budget. Great. Thank you, Laura. And Chad, there are key large-scale failures in health and development which occurred because the programs focused on outputs as opposed to outcome measurements. What are some key examples of programs or organizations which failed because outputs as opposed to outcomes were the focus from the onset? And what should they have done differently? Well, I think the, you know, I think the, the one that you started off with at the beginning of, of of the you know tonight i mean looking at bed nets i mean there was a you know there's been a big focus on getting nets to people um clearly we've shown as you know those that are social marketing and, and communities that are involved in that type of work that we can do a wonderful job of uh, marketing bed nets distributing them uh getting them to you know populations uh, both you know rural off rail um you know down to the last mile um, but, but, you know, we failed in some ways around, you know, figuring out how to set them up, how to wash them, um, you know, what would happen if people get bit even with nets. So, I mean, there's a, you know, there's, there's one wonderful, fabulous story about marketing and distributing and another story that's, you know, not as good around the, the aftermath of that. So I think that's one example. Um, you know, another example that we deal with a lot, I mean, on the HIV and AIDS side, and South Africa is a very good example. We've done really well um, in terms of treatment. I mean, in South Africa, you know, you've got over 2 million people that are on treatment. Um, it's a wonderful uh, story. Uh, but, you know, in many ways, I think, you know, we still have, you know, new infections going up. Um, and, you know, the question could be how well are we doing on the prevention side of things? And I think there's a, you know, there's a debate about whether or not we still need to, you know, continue to have traditional HIV and AIDS prevention that is very uh, participatory, community-based. Um, gets down to the, you know, the last mile, or those that feel that, you know, we, we, we don't need that as much that we're going to be able to, to treat our way out of it. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really a, a mixture of, of both. And then the other example I think I gave in the beginning, you know, mother baby packs, I mean, I think that's a good example of where, you know, mother baby packs were distributed. Um, every mother got a pack of, of medication that was HIV positive. It was combined with, you know, uh, you know, highly effective drugs, prophylactic, antibiotics, um, this and that. But, but understanding really the back end of that in terms of what that, you know, was there adherence? Were the baby packs just being taken home? Um, and, you know, vitamins used for other things or given out to other people or, or these types of examples, um, you know, could sort of question, I think, the efficacy of that program. Great. Thank you so much, Chad. And Lisa, what are some more simple data collection options for organizations or programs on a tight budget so that any organization can measure outcomes? 
So I think, um, again, it really is a, a, a question about planning and, and thinking, and I think a, reflecting a lot of what, what's already been said. The first thing is find out if somebody's already measuring it. Uh, do. Um, the second is see if there's other ways of getting at that data that might not be um, measuring everybody. So can you use simple sort of uh, sampling methods. For example, we use a lot of something called lot quality assurance sampling, which sort of says, are you doing well or are you not doing well, and can save you uh, a lot of a lot of money and effort doing things like that. Um, I think there's a growing um, interest in using cell phone uh, cell phones to collect, uh, for example, user defined uh, data, whether it's uh, you know deaths, whether it's uh, satisfaction, there's been a lot of innovation around that. I would, I would say that was a little bit of um, sort of buyer beware because I have seen sometimes where you, you have M Health as a um, solution looking for a problem. So if you're going to use it, make sure it's something that somebody else has used before um, and that it's something that's designed not just for collecting the data but actually for using the data. But I think the first thing is, is somebody else measuring it? The second is, um, can you do it through through some sort of sampling method so you don't have to collect everything on everybody? And if that isn't the case, often paper is best, but also start to think uh, more creatively. And my hope is that within two years or three years, the next time I get asked that question, there'll be you know a number of different very effective apps that we can that we can help patients use to help us understand, to have providers use as they're doing um, observations. We're in the middle of a large trial looking at the safe childbirth checklist developed by the WHO and, and Ariadne in India, and we're actually collecting a lot of this information using very, very simple um, tablets and, um, and also using a call center to determine uh, mother and baby outcomes at seven days. So I think there's a lot of um, innovation going on. Uh, I'd say for an organization with a tight budget, uh, use something that somebody else has already used successfully. Um, and again, I think you know, two or three years from now, hopefully there'll be a lot more options out there. Great, thank you, Lisa. And another question for you as well, Lisa. How do you get good quantitative data to evidence utility of an intervention when you're working with very qualitative data, such as psychosocial interventions? Um, I, I think it's, it's a little bit challenging. Um, I think that you sometimes have to focus either on the process. So we sometimes develop things down to uh, sort of five questions. The first three questions we ask is how many, how well, and so what. So how many is are you even doing the intervention? How well is are you doing it the way you're supposed to be doing it? And there are um, probably ways of doing observations where you can actually create uh, observation checklists or other ways that people can say, yeah, they were supposed to talk about these three things and they did, or they did they give the patient, the people sort of time to talk. So things that are normally qualitative but that we can actually quantify. And then I think the, it goes back to how you've defined effectiveness and the outcomes of your, um, of your intervention. If it is something that is only able to be measured qualitatively, then you have to figure out rigorous, you know, rigorous enough uh, ways of measuring it qualitatively, whether it is patient satisfaction, whether it is um, well-being, you know, looking at other types of, of psychometrics. Uh, it's a challenge, but I think if we uh, are able to articulate and define what success is, then usually there are creative ways of trying to figure out how to measure it without reducing it too much to a, a single number. Terrific, thank you. And uh, we have a question also from an MDMPH student who says that they're very interested in outcomes research and they're wondering how can students get involved in outcomes research and possibly make capstone projects based on outcomes research. And I think probably this question might be best suited for perhaps both Shuba and as, as well as Lisa. Shuba, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'd encourage students to really identify professors who are doing research in the area that you're interested in. They would probably be uh, a very good point of contact to at least get that conversation started and can help guide you in terms of resources, maybe setting up an independent study, or for your capstone or practicums if you um, are required to do such a project. 
but certainly using um, and, and reaching out to faculty and experts in the field who are working in that area is, is a good starting point. So I, I would just echo that as well. I think the, the challenge that I have sometimes is when students come and they want to do outcomes research and they have a, a new project. Uh, you know, I'm really interested in looking at something that nobody is, is looking at. And that's, you know, that I say that's a either a master's or even a PhD project. Um, so I think the key thing is, especially when you're learning how to do it, is to find somebody who's doing something in an area that you're interested in. It may not be a perfect fit. Um, I think sometimes it's even more important who your mentor is than, than the actual um, area of expertise. I, when I got my MPH, was really interested in HIV. There happened to be nobody doing it, but I learned a lot about pharmacoepidemiology from a great mentor and then was able to use those skills to go on to, to areas of HIV. So choose a good mentor. Um, try to get involved in a project where you have a part that you, is, is yours, but that you are able to um, learn from other people as you're going along, and then use that as a jumping off, part, uh, jumping off point for, your next, uh, for, the, for the next thing that you do. Terrific. Thank you. And for our final question, and we'd love to hear the thoughts from any and all of our panelists. For individuals with low literacy skills in the U.S. and abroad, what are effective interventions to improve the use of healthcare services and to improve health outcomes? So I, I sort of, I'm happy to take that one on unless somebody else wants to, uh, to come in based on their experience. Wait, go ahead, Lisa. All right. So again, I sort of going back to some of the, the work that we were doing um, at Endemic, where we had a lot of people who are low literacy. I think that there's a couple of things that you that you really need to think about. Um, the first is you need to engage with the community and, and empower them, what we call sort of demand side uh, intervention, so that people understand what is the value, why is it important, what are their rights, and what are their what is their access. Uh, the second is that you need to make sure that the interventions that you're doing um, for your healthcare services are patient-centered, so that listening to the patients. What are the reasons why, and we know women do this, women in labor will bypass, uh, institute, will bypass facilities to go to the next one, and if you ask them, it has a lot to do with disrespect and abuse. So listening to the patients, making sure that you're meeting their, not just their health needs, but the psychosocial needs and that it's a responsive uh, uh, organization. I think that to improve health outcomes, we just did a literature review of demand-side interventions to get women to come in for antenatal care and deliveries, and they were very effective in doing that, but they had very variable response in terms of reducing maternal and neonatal mortality, and that's because not all of them ensured quality once they get there. So if you're going to get people to actually come into your health services, make sure that when they get there, the services are good and, and, and will meet their, their health care needs. Um, I think one of the other things that's really important is um, making sure that, that the way that people are trained to speak, and this is a, a challenge in the U.S. in medical schools, but I think getting better, that, that people are talking in a way that is appropriate literacy, that's culturally competent, and that the materials we give people are done in ways that they, can, that they can really understand it. And then finally, I think really understanding what are the barriers and um, trying to figure out what are solutions that are replicable, that are feasible, and that you can do now. So if, if the problem is user fees, you know, you may need to figure out ways to support that, but at the same time also think long term and what are the policy levers that you can use, what are the, the interventions you can do from the bottom up as well as the top down. If there's a bad road, you can, you know, advocate to get a new road, but also potentially leverage community health workers to deliver care in the community or figure out how you can use local transport in lieu of, in lieu of ambulances. So I think it, taking a holistic approach, listening to the patients, making sure that once you get them into the facilities, the facilities are good, and think about the short-term as well as the long-term solutions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you to all of our panelists for your incredible insight into all of these questions from the audience. We all greatly appreciate it. And thank you to our audience as well for your terrific questions. Ms. Webinar, webinar, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer.